The problem is Tornado Cash is different, right? It is decentralized software that isn't a centralized entity like those non-compliant exchanges, like Blender, right? Like these other entities that they've designated in the past. And what made it so exceptional is this didn't just affect illicit actors. This affected regular users. Hey guys, Akiba here from Crypto Slate. Today we've got a really interesting guest. Uh, we have Ari Redboard from TRM Labs. Hi Ari, how are you doing? Hey, I'm terrific. Uh, Liam, thank you so much for having me on. Oh no, thanks for thanks for coming on. Um, obviously, I reached out during the the whole Tornado Cash incident um, because I'd seen on uh, Crypto Twitter um, some links to the compliance API that you guys had, and then I sort of I went and did some digging and just really sort of interesting. So, how's how's this whole last uh, few weeks been for for yourself or well, for for TRM? Yeah, you know, look, it, it's been extraordinary. I mean, I think, you, look, you're so in this space and have been for so long that, you know, sort of crypto never sleeps. And, and this is just sort of one one more example of it. Um, you know, prior to joining uh, TRM about two years ago, I spent about 11 years at the U.S. Department of Justice and then about two years at the U.S. Treasury Department. Um, but I will say sort of just in the last two years, uh, we've seen so much activity, uh, whether it's sort of law enforcement related, regulatory related. And I think what we're seeing here is, um, you know, from from OFAC at, at, at the U.S. Treasury Department is really trying to figure out how do you regulate sort of what what do sanctions really mean in the age of decentralized finance? And um, I think that this was um, the latest in a series of sort of attempts to figure out how best to engage with or regulate the space. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's an interesting one. I mean, obviously, given that it's it's, it's an open source project, um, and I think that's been a lot of the sort of the kickback um, against this is that it's open source code. Can you kind of can you censor code? Should you censor code? All of these different questions. Um, but that's not just what you do. It's a compliance API. Obviously, you have a, a full suite of products with, with TLM. So, what's what's the sort of the main um, sort of business within TRM, and how does it operate within Web three? Yeah, no, I really appreciate you asking that. So, yeah, so we are anti money laundering for for crypto. So uh, we work with uh, law enforcement to track and trace the flow of illicit funds. So if there's a ransomware attack, uh, we're able to track and trace the flow of, of Bitcoin or another crypto asset to build an investigation, hopefully to stop bad guys right from ultimately taking advantage mm -hmm. of, of this new financial system that we're building. Uh, we also work with uh, cryptocurrency businesses, so some of the largest exchanges, but also some of the sort of you know truly startup DeFi projects and NFT issuers and marketplaces. Um, and, and for them, we're, we're monitoring transactions. We're making sure that if you're an NFT issuer, that you're not transacting with a terrorist financier or a sanctioned actor or, um, you know, or some other sort of illicit actor in the crypto space. And then finally, we work with financial institutions who are trying to figure out how do we offer crypto to customers? How do we engage with this new ecosystem? How do we fund a liquidity pool? And understand sort of what are the risks associated with that. So, so basically, you know, we're 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 an investigative tool, but we're really anti money laundering, um, anti money laundering in the crypto space. So, one of the products that you have is this compliance API, which I think is it's a free API, I believe. Is there a fee to it? So, or? so yeah. So there's there's a number of different sort of products. I mean, our typical sort of TRM product is is something that we um, we offer to sort of again larger crypto businesses, financial mm -hmm. institutions. But, you know, when when Russia invaded Ukraine and there was all this conversation about sort of, you know, is crypto going to be used for sanctions evasion? You know, literally that weekend, we released a free sanction screening tool. Um, it doesn't sort of have all of the anti money laundering uh, data in there. But what it has is it allows smaller businesses that maybe don't have large compliance teams like Coinbase. Right. Uh, you know, early stage DeFi NFTs to ensure that they are not transacting with sanctioned entities. Because I think, you know, with Russia in particular, we really saw the crypto space come together and say, hey, look, um, you know, we, we, we're all in this together and we really don't want to see sanctioned Russian actors, sanctioned Russian entities use crypto to evade sanctions. So it's a combination of, of a couple different products. But, um, but yeah, no, there's, there's a free um, sanction screening tool that's available to you know smarter smaller DeFi or NFT issuers. Yeah, because I remember that was 
that was the API that was being integrated into kind of like Aave and Uniswap um, in order to kind of help remove sanctioned addresses to the, from their platform of which some obviously are tornado cash um and i found that myself i remember like actually some of the wording on your website does mention like the russian sanctions and being able to stay away from that did you imagine when you made that api though that it would then be used to stop open source software such as tornado cash and what is the sort of thinking from trms as as to how well that product is currently working yeah, no, it, it, great, great question. And just to sort of back up a second, like I, def, I think I, I would want to avoid talking about sort of the way specific, you know, folks in the space use these types of tools because as I'll kind of get to it in a second, what 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 crypto businesses are really doing is they're taking our data, um, and they're using it to ultimately make decisions about which crypto addresses to block, which ones to sort of allow, and that's really the way you use TRM if you're really any crypto business, but that also includes sort of front end DeFi protocols. Um, so, so yeah, look, I think it's really important to back up a second and, you know, Tornado Cash is different. I think you've really gotten to the heart of it, right? You know, what we've seen over the last really two years from, from OFAC is targeting very specific illicit actors, what I'd sort of call the, the illicit underbelly of this crypto ecosystem that we're all building, right? Uh, mixers that conspired with darknet markets, right? You know, mixing services like Helix and Bitcoin Fog that advertised on Alpha Bay as a way to launder the proceeds of, you know, narcotic sales and mm -hmm. other types of illicit activity, right? They were going after non-compliant Russia-based exchanges that were allowing, you know, millions of dollars of ransomware payments to flow through. They were going after the darknet markets themselves, like Silk Road and Alpha Bay and 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 um, and Hydra. I think what was a real uh, kind of watershed moment for um, for for OFAC was the attack on the Ronin blockchain, uh, the Ronin okay. bridge, right? You know, I think that what that did in many respects is we've seen North Korea attack cryptocurrency businesses and cryptocurrency entities for years. North Korea is an early adopter of really professionalized cyber criminal groups that attack cryptocurrency businesses. Because what North Korea has realized, essentially, it's a place cut off from the, the global financial system they've realized that like in the age of crypto, you can steal funds directly, you know, and, and you can use that, those funds, if you can off ramp them to, to fund weapons proliferation and, and other destabilizing activity. But Ronin really was a big deal because when North Korea attacked the Ronin bridge, it stole, you know, over $600 million, you know, for a country with a GDP, GDP of a banana Republic, you know, this is, that was a, that's a really a significant, that's a lot of money and a really significant national security threat. So it was so interestingly, that was the first time that OFAC ever added a crypto address associated with Lazarus Group, associated with North Korea, uh, to its sanctions list. Okay. okay. And that was the address where the funds went in from the Ronin attack. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we saw OFAC use blockchain analytics to follow the funds. So they th those funds then went to three additional addresses, which were all added to the OFAC sanctions list. They then watched those funds go through Blender.io, which is a centralized mixing service, um, and sanctioned Blender.io. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. the, the the elephant in the room, though, was much more activity had gone through Tornado Cash, and you know according to TRM, we've seen about a billion dollars of North Korea related funds go into Tornado Cash over the last, you know, year or so. We've seen Tornado Cash used in North Korea's sort of top 10 largest hacks. So that's the context. I just think it's important. Con that's how OFAC is looking at this. Mm -hmm. They're like, all right, yeah, definitely. this is the, this is the number one money laundering concern for a truly dangerous state actor who are, who are stealing funds and laundering them. We need to stop the, the money laundering, because if you can stop the money laundering, maybe you can stop the hacks. The problem is, and this is, I, I appreciate you, you being patient with me. The problem is Tornado Cash is different, right? It is decentralized software that isn't a centralized entity like those non-compliant exchanges, like Blender, right? Like these other entities that they've designated in the past. And what made it so exceptional is this didn't just affect illicit actors. This affected regular users of 
of a tool. And one thing that I've been asked, I know your listeners get this, but I think it's worth repeating. I get asked all the time, well, what would a non-illicit actor, what would a regular person need the use of a mixer? It seems like it's just for money laundering. Oh, there's, there's plenty of use cases, yeah. And, and, the, and the answer is there are lots of great use cases, right? Like in a more and more open financial system where your employer is going to have your crypto address, where there are all these public addresses all over Twitter and, and elsewhere. Um, you know, we saw all these celebrities dusted uh, in the in the tornado cash, in the wake of tornado cash. So there are all kinds of reasons that you want to add more privacy into your transactions on blockchains. And I yeah. think that that's why, that's why so many legitimate users use services like tornado cash. So the question out of all of this, uh, because I think to me, where we need to ultimately end up is we need to stop North Korea. We need to stop illicit actors from taking advantage of services like Tornado Cash, okay, or or any other decentralized protocol. But at the same time, we need to, you know, make sure that regular users are not affected by it. Um, mm -hmm. Now, you know, it 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 is really complicated. But I think we've even seen movement in that direction in the last few weeks. You know, um, the way TRM works essentially is we work with DeFi front ends, other types of entities, in order to screen for sanctions. Uh, and you know, what's so what's so interesting is that's always been an automated process, because before Tornado Cash, uh, you wanted to keep. You know, I don't care who you are, you wanted to keep illicit actors, you know, off your platforms, right? OFAC before Tornado Cash primarily designated crypto addresses associated with terrorist financiers. Hmm. And you know something, you know something ultimately you wanted to keep that terrorist financier off your platform, but you probably also wanted to keep anyone they transacted with off your platform because it was involving terrorist financing. But again, hmm. that's what makes Tornado Cash so different. And I think even sort of in those days following Tornado Cash, a lot of these processes were automated because cryptocurrency, you know, small DeFi startups and other types of companies, again, don't have the resources, don't have those giant compliance teams. So they automated a lot of these processes. And when you automate those processes, you're going to block addresses associated with or that have transacted with, uh, with Tornado Cash. And I think ultimately the answer is and, and, and has started to be uh, we need to block all of the addresses that are actually on OFAC sanctions list. And I think everyone has essentially said that. Look, if we can block them, we should block them. Those are addresses that are actually on the list. It gets more complicated when you talk about, should we also sanction addresses that have transaction, transacted with those? Yeah, there's, there's two things there, isn't there? Because yeah. there's, um, yeah, there's the, where does the trail go? Because then North Korea, let's, let's say this is North Korea, Lazarus Project. Yeah. Their next move then is to just send funds to every doxed address in the United States because then they've all interacted with a, a terrorist organization. Like you can't stop yourself from being receiving funds. So you've got a sort of an issue there. But I think the, the other side is, like I say, as, as a Brit, I don't feel like I should come under the US sanctions. I'm not within that territory. That's their decision and that's fine. Um, they're allowed to make the decision for people within the United States, but this affects people all over the world. And the thing that makes me very worried about this is it feels like the start is like a dangerous precedent for the US to start deciding what is and what is not okay in, uh, in Web3. This example, it's a little cut and dry. I don't think there's going to be many people that are trying to defend North Korea in, in the space, but there could be other sanctions that they decide. Let's say they decide to go, they have a political disagreement with, say, the UK over something, and now the UK addresses for some project get sanctioned. And now TRM's API is using OFAC um, uh, data, and now I'm being sanctioned. And it kind of, it feels like, you tell me there's a centralized problem here. Like that, I'm very concerned about the the entity and the sort of the end goal. I think it's hard to argue with the end goal, trying to keep people safe. But that centralization angle, like why why should the U.S. and the and OFAC decide for the rest of the world? What's your thoughts? Yeah, no, it, it's it's a great question. And look, I mean, this is it's a broader. It's way, this question is way beyond uh, crypto and decentralized finance into sort of like you know the use of sanctions 
um, the effectiveness of sanctions, sort of all, all those kinds of issues. But look, I, I think the re- it's interesting, you know, I, I keep coming back to Tornado Cash to some extent, right? And I think that's why what's so interesting about what's next, right? Tornado Cash was being used aggressively by illicit actors to move funds, including North Korea, which again, globally is sort of one of those places that the world is, is significantly concerned about. Um, I think it's going to be interesting to see sort of what OFAC does next in terms of going after other services, if, if, if at all. Um, you know, is Tornado Cash an outlier because of the North Korean nexus, or is this going to be sort of a trend of going after these types of services, even if smaller amounts of funds are being um, are being uh, being moved? I'm guessing it's going to be the former, and that is that that to some extent Tornado Cash is an outlier. Um, but you you know, look, I th- I think your point is well taken. I think that the reality is ultimately uh, businesses, whether they're crypto businesses, financial institutions, always need to sort of take their own a, you know, approach when it comes to sanctions. And I think one way we solve for some of this is, look, we block addresses that are on the OFAC sanctions list, just like we block addresses that are on the UK or EU or UN sanctions list. And one thing that's really interesting, and this is outside of, of crypto, so apologies, but we're already hearing about this idea of consolidating a list globally when it comes to the Russia sanctions, because there's so much uh, agreement globally on those um, and those don't affect crypto as much as they affect sort of other finance, you know, sort of traditional financial institutions. But the reality is, I think we're seeing a move towards, you know, look, global democracy is coming together and trying to get this right. I think the other piece to this is, you know, what we do at TRM is we we can provide more and more granular data to allow companies to make decisions that aren't just automated or aren't just sort of you block anyone who's been dusted or any of this kinds of stuff, right? I think what we're ultimately going to see is that individuals who are receiving unsolicited funds from a sanctioned entity are not going to ultimately be blocked. I think we're already starting but, but, to see that. How, yeah. can we, how, can we, how can we manage that? How can we police yeah. it? So I think a couple of ways. One, um, we need more guidance from regulators. Um, and I think we're hopeful, I'm, I'm hopeful and I'm a pretty hopeful person that we're going to see that hopefully over the next few months that we'll see OFAC, we'll see other regulators come out and say, hey, look, this is the expectation that you have if you're a DeFi business. And this look, you know, Tether came out and said that they're not going to block those secondary funds, the funds that are associated with sanctioned addresses. They said, we're going to block the sanctioned addresses, but not the other ones until we get more guidance. And I think that's a fair approach and one that's been taken by some businesses. I think you're opening yourself up to a little risk there, right? Because some of the addresses that are transacting with sanctioned entities are likely North Korea or or nurse financiers or, you know, scammers and fraud. Um, So what we, so you ask sort of how you do this. And one way you do this is sort of like, you know, our data can surface insights into, for example, when the transaction was sent, you know, was it, was it, was it um, a deposit or a withdrawal? Was it, um, what was the time, you know, of it? How much, right? Is this dusting or is this something a more significant transaction? So there, I think there are ways you can do this a little bit more granularly, maybe not in the same, not with the same efficiency that you can in an automated way. But I think in these specific instances like Tornado Cash, we're going to see more and more sort of, you know, this risk-based approach where you're taking a little bit more granular look at addresses to assure that you're not, you're not sort of over. Um, you know, I don't know, over complying or some some version of that. So, so on on that note, then, um, is there um, a way that what was I going to say? In, in terms of when we we're sort of sending funds, is there a way to? Um, sorry, I've actually gone blank on that. So it was really interesting what you were saying. I had another point. Um, I'll have to chop this here. Um, one second. Um, Oh yeah, so with there being sort of associated addresses and how that works, there's a lot of say ETH that's been stolen that's in sanctioned addresses right now. Is that Ethereum like is that blacklisted? Is that like unusable? Have we essentially taken that Ethereum out of the supply now? What walk me through that that scenario again? So a a sanctioned address has received a load of Ethereum. So now, theoretically, you're going to want to stop that Ethereum from being used elsewhere because it's stolen funds. So is that essentially now just blacklisted? Is there any way to get that Ethereum back into circulation or should we consider the Ethereum uh, supply dropped? 
Yeah, look, I, I think that, you know, it's, it's a really good question. And um, I think the reality is that we're, you know, one, one of the reasons there, there's sort of guidance needed on some of this is, look, you know, in traditional finance, you know, the, your, your, the analogy to your question is sort of, you know, cash, right? Like yeah. if there's cash that's been associated with some sort of illicit activity, is that cash tainted for all time? And the answer is certainly no, right? Like I'm sure that we're all paid with proceeds of, of drug sales, you know, when we get our chains at the grocery store. Um, and it sh crypto should not require, there should not be, it should not be more regulated in that way than the space just because of the technology itself. So I think what, to answer your question, I think we, what we really need to understand is sort of like, well, how far back should we have to look, right? The blockchain is forever. You can go back to transaction one, right? How far back should we look uh, or, or are we gonna need to look to really understand, um, you know, whether or not uh, these are the direct proceeds of illicit activity or it's something else. In other words, sort of it is now moved through the chain, uh, to, you know, beyond where where sort of the, the bad activity occurred. So um, I know that sounds a little bit like a cop-out answer. Uh, it, it's not only because I think these are some of the critical issues in the space right now that we need guidance on from regulators. Like how far should we go back? You know, how much exposure to sanctions, you know, is is, is enough to taint a liquidity pool, right? Like there, there are answers that we don't know. That, that we, there are questions we don't know the answer to. And I think it's, you know, like anything else, regulation is playing itself out right now, particularly in the DeFi space. I mean, if you look around in the anti-money laundering sanctions and decentralized finance space, there's very little. There's some um, there's some discussion of, of this issue by FATF, which is the Financial Action Task Force. It's sort of the global UN of, of money laundering. It's a standard setting body. It's not a regulator. And then actually, I'd encourage folks to look. The um, Abu Dhabi Global Markets, ADGM, has put out some interesting uh, discussion paper on you know, sort of the obligations of, of decentralized finance, what it means to actually be decentralized, et cetera. But like, you know, we, we need more guidance and I think that ultimately will be coming, but, you know, uh, regulation takes time, certainly. Do, do you think that centralized regulation can work in a decentralized world though? Do we need, like, I, I feel we need to get to a, a way of figuring out some form of decentralized regulation where maybe like, similar to the UN sort of thing, we have a crypto regulator where other pe other countries get a say or the project or something so that it's not just coming from the US or the Europe or or some someone else. Yeah, no, it, look, I think you're raising, you know, the really the, the, the key questions and, you know, the nature of crypto, right? Permissionless, decentralized, cross-border value transfer at the speed of the internet really means that no central regulator or no one country can regulate alone in the space. I mean, and this is true. If you talk to global regulators, you know, the, the key regulators in the world, you know, the US Treasury Department, um, you know, UK entities like HM Treasury, you talk to MAS in Singapore. Um, th what they will say is that anti-money laundering regulation in the crypto space is only as strong as its weakest link. Um, because the reality is that if you don't, if you're not going to move funds you know, in the US, you can do it in, in Russia or, or, or elsewhere that mm. do, don't have sort of those compliance controls in place. So it's really a critical issue. I mean, I, I love the question. I'm not sure I'm naive enough to believe that we'll ever get international consensus on like a global regulator. Uh, no, yeah, because yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> e even within the US, you've yeah. got the SEC. Even, and in the, the, even in the US, yeah, you re really well said. Yeah, but I will they, say that like CFTC, I, I agree with but, you. I agree with you and it's a real challenge. But I will say one thing that is sometimes missing from this is look, there are also qualities of crypto that that make it, you know, much harder to launder funds. Much, it's much much safer, much better in many respects. And and look, you know, you talk about, you know, to date, regulatory frameworks have always involved intermediaries, right? You have financial institutions, you know, Bank of America, City, Standard Charter, you know, whoever, they are filing suspicious activity reports in a siloed way. Right. They're going directly to their regulator to file these reports, to get a license, you know, all that kind of thing. And the reality is that that doesn't have to happen anymore in crypto because regulators can actually have real time visibility on financial flows on open ledgers like they never had before. Um, so I think that, like, you know, on the one hand, there's a lot of challenges, but on the one on the other hand, sort of the unique visibility, the unique capabilities of blockchains potentially allow for regulators to regulate in whole, wholly new ways. And this might require revamping in some respects, sort of, you know, our, our, our statutes, our laws. But, but I think there's a lot of promise there. 
um, as well. And I, I don't think it's all sort of necessarily doom and gloom in the regulatory space. I'll, I'll take your optimism. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one thing I did want to know, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll make this one of the, the last questions. But so in, in terms of the, the data that sort of DeFi platforms get, is it just a sort of a list of addresses and they just have to go by what you say should be sanctioned or do they get more granular information? So as I mentioned, sort of like we are surfacing, um, you know, more and more granular information. That's not just, you know, you know, are you on the sanctions list or have you transacted with a sanctioned entity, but also sort of helping, you know, whether it's DeFi or really any other entities, even centralized exchanges in the crypto space, you know, providing data on, as I said, inflows and outflows, you know, the amounts uh, at issue, what is the time? And those are that's all information that could be really helpful in understanding, hey, is this a regular user or is this someone who is, you know, funding a terrorist financier that's been sanctioned by OFAC or the UN or the EU. So, um, so, so it, yeah. How, how did, so how did the, the dusting addresses get, um, caught up in all of this, um, with Aave, um, for that? It was, it was like 12 hours or something, but crypto Twitter went nuts about it. Yeah, no, no, for sure. So I think, you know, look, what happened with the dusting, it was, was very clear. And that was like these processes, you know, again, we talked about sort of tornado cash being exceptional and very, very different than anything anyone had ever dealt with before. And really, I think what we saw is those, those, those dusting attacks. And I, I got to tell you, you know, anyone who uses, you know, sanctions as an offensive weapon, even to make a statement, um, you know, I've sort of significant problems with that, that activity, but the um, reality, we, 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 this, this may be an area where we disagree on, but I like, I like, I, I like that. I uh, definitely, I totally ad admire and respect what you do um, for sure. I, I would just say that, um, you know, th these processes have traditionally been automated. And if you have an automated process, then you are inevitably going to uh, uh, sort of net anyone who's also transacting with a sanctioned entity. And I think that's why essentially we've seen a lot of movement towards sort of taking a more granular approach where it's not just this automated process where it's blocking these addresses, but it's saying, hey, is this dusting? You know, and how do we know that? Well, we know the timing, we know the amounts, we know uh, the, the, the fact that it was a, um, you know, inflows as opposed to outflows you know those those types of those types of things so um yeah i, I think that uh there, there are definitely things that can be done but again you know tornado cash was different and it was exceptional and the processes that were in place to screen for sanctions before were different than they are today ba just based on sort of what happened a few weeks ago see so it's exactly that that i feel that the, the hacktivists will call them whoever did this um, I actually do think it was a fantastic um, piece of work in that your product's probably better because of, because of it now, because you didn't realize that, you say, it was a, a different um, way of doing things. And it's raised the profile of the potential uh, precedent that this sets of issues within a decentralized world. Um, I mean, I feel sorry for anyone that did get dusted and went through sort of the pain and issues with it. But I do feel it raised the profile of it because before that, the fact that it was just like Tony Cash was sanctioned, it wasn't as big a news piece until people realized what that could mean. And that's why I think the, the dusting attack was was quite clever because it raised the profile of the whole the whole issue. I, I think it's a fair interpretation. It really is. Yeah. And, and really well articulated. I, I, I also imagine that whoever did that... Um, probably made your life a living hell for a few days. So <laughs> I think that's probably look, why. I, I, look, I, I think to your point, um, one of the things that has come out of it is sort of, I think people having more of an understanding, and this is why I appreciate, you know, you taking the time to talk, uh, more of an understanding of like what we do, right? There was this narrative about does TRM block addresses? And the answer is emphatically no. We provide data to businesses to help them decide which addresses to block. Um, that could mean just addresses that are on the sanctions list, or that can mean sort of uh, trying to understand sort of what are the addresses that have transacted with those addresses as well. So um, yeah, no, I think your, your point is great. And that is, I think we're all, and I think that's what we sort of have to remember. And I know crypto Twitter is not the best place for this, but we, we do, we really are all in this together. And uh, the reality is like, we need to stop bad actors, right? Like even take North Korea out of the equation for a moment. Let's say this is not an existential national security issue. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, in the age of of of, of um, the Internet, a hack meant the loss of usernames and passwords. Right. Um, but in the age of crypto, 
people's having their life savings stolen. You know, small businesses are being lost based on these hacks. Um, you know, DeFi companies are going out of business, right? Um, so, so the reality is crypto is never going to work if we don't sort of remove this threat. I'm, I'm, you're not going to put your money in an exchange, a centralized exchange or in a DeFi protocol if you believe that there's a chance it's not going to be there the next day. And I think that's why it's so important to stop the laundering of funds, but at the same time, you know, really walk that fine line between dramatically affecting regular users. And I think that's the challenge. I think there are technology solutions to this. Um, but I, I think it's, I think it's really important. Like, you know, this is, this is this, this sort of new, uh, this, this new sort of internet of money that we're all building together. We got to keep it safe and it, it's figuring out how do you keep it safe, but also, also at the same time, ensure that regular users are able to, to build in some degree of privacy. Thank you very much for your, your time, Ari. And um, I'm glad that we had this chat because I was a little bit concerned myself that TRM was going to be this kind of faceless corporation that didn't get crypto, that was just trying to like centralize the system. And you say that you were blocking addresses. I think you've articulated what you guys do really well. Um, and ultimately, you are the good guys in the, the forensic tooling to help people that have lost funds. As you say, that's like... The fact that you, you can exist and you can do that is part of the main sort of legitimate use case of crypto. As you say, it's open, it's transparent. If someone gets something stolen, TRM's a sort of company that can go and help track and trace those funds to get the funds back. We need companies like that. So I'm really glad that we had this chat. It's kind of cleared a lot of things up for me. And um, I'll definitely be a... Uh, um, hitting you up though to get a little bit more information on the API and figure out how it all works because I'm I'm just a geek at heart and I'm just intrigued as to how it how it how it works. Love it. Really excited to continue the conversation and um, yeah, thank you and thank you for, for for what you just said. Look, I mean, I think we're all on a mission to build a safer financial system and um, you know these conversations are absolutely critical um, as, as we do this and really kind of just understanding the technology, understanding the, the motivation. So yeah, no, Liam, just total pleasure and thanks for having me. Thank you very much and I'll speak to you again soon. Great. Okay, guys, that's the end of the video. Thanks for watching to the end. It really means a lot. Um, if you're interested in watching more content like this, subscribe to the channel. Um, it doesn't cost a penny. Um, if you could like the video, it really helps it get out there in terms of the algorithm. I know everyone says that, but it is true, unfortunately. Um, and leave comments below about sort of what content you'd like to see next, who else you'd like us to interview. Um, we've got a massive Rolex of people. We're trying to find really interesting projects and getting a, a different angle uh, for you guys to, to get some insight into the industry. Um, you can like us on, follow us on, on Twitter. Um, so at CryptoSlate or myself, I'm a Keeper Blade. Uh, and obviously the website where the majority of our content is, is CryptoSlate.com. So go there now. We have a membership, um, which is called Edge, where you can get insights, data, um, exclusive articles, some really great stuff. Um, and there is some cool stuff coming up with Edge for Edge members uh, in the not too distant future. So uh, check it out. And until next time, 